Hello everyone, in this video we're going to talk about airway assessment, an essential step we must always perform before intubating any patient. Before we manage the airway, we need to understand what it is. The airway is the pathway that carries air from the nose and mouth down to the lungs, including the nasal passages, oral cavity, pharynx, larynx, and trachea. If it isn't clear, gas exchange can't occur properly, and serious problems can develop quickly. Any issue along this path, whether structural or functional, can affect breathing and oxygen delivery, which is why assessing the airway first is so important. But sometimes, because of certain patient factors or clinical situations, the airway can give us trouble, meaning we might not be able to ventilate or intubate the patient. When that happens, we call it a difficult airway. Clinically difficult airway is defined as a situation where a trained anesthesiologist cannot easily ventilate with a mask, cannot intubate the trachea, or both. Different guidelines describe it a little differently though. The American Society of Anesthesiologists defines a difficult airway as existing when a conventionally trained anesthesiologist experiences difficulty with face mask ventilation of the upper airway, difficulty with tracheal intubation or both. The Canadian guidelines are broader. They define it as a situation where an experienced provider anticipates or encounters difficulty with any or all of face mask ventilation, direct or indirect laryngoscopy, tracheal intubation, supraglottic airway use or surgical airway. So difficult airway is a broader term used to describe the wider sets of airway issues that we might encounter. Among them, what concerns us the most is the difficult mask ventilation and difficult intubation because they are our primary weapon when dealing with a patient S airway. Let's define them too. Difficult mask ventilation is defined as the inability to maintain SpO2 or oxygen saturation above 90% using 100% oxygen with a face mask. And, difficult intubation is defined as requiring more than 3 attempts or taking more than 10 minutes to successfully intubate using conventional laryngoscopy. The incidence of difficult bag mask ventilation is reported to be between 1.4% and 15% while difficult intubation ranges from 5% to 8% when using a standard laryngoscope. So, what exactly are we aiming to achieve with airway assessment? Well, the main goal is to help us spot any risk factors that could make ventilation or intubation difficult. If we think the airway could be tricky, we can get back up ready like a video laryngoscope, a fiber optic scope, an LMA, or even surgical airway tools before things get out of hand. For this we follow a difficult airway algorithm which we will see in a separate video. You can pause the video and check this algorithm which is self-explanatory. Finally, let's move on to the main topic of this video, assessment of the airway. There isn't a single test that can perfectly predict difficulty, so we always combine history, physical examination, and sometimes investigation. In history, we often find the first and most important clues about a potentially difficult airway. We go through the patient's notes and anesthesia records to check if there has ever been any difficulty with intubation or mask ventilation in the past. We also ask about neck surgeries, burns, or trauma that might have altered the airway anatomy. Concurrent conditions like obesity and obstructive sleep apnea, congenital syndromes in pediatric cases, diabetes arthropathy, head and neck radiation therapy and rheumatoid arthritis and other connective tissue disorders. Finally we always check the timing of the last meal because a full stomach increases the risk during airway management. In general examination, we basically examine the airway from the mouth to the trachea. An easy way to remember this is by using the mnemonic 5D. The first D is dentition. Here, we look at the patient's teeth and jaw structure. Prominent upper incisors, loose teeth, edentulous gums, or a receding chin can all make bag and mask and laryngoscopy more difficult. The second D is distortion. This refers to anything that alters the normal anatomy, such as swelling, infection, tumors or trauma. 
The third D is disproportion, which describes an imbalance in airway structures that can make ventilation and intubation harder. A large tongue relative to the mouth can block the laryngeal view, a small mouth opening limits laryngoscope access, a short neck reduces space to align airway axes, and a thick neck adds bulk that hinders visualization. The fourth D is dysmotility, which refers to restricted movement of the jaw or cervical spine that can complicate airway management. Limited jaw opening, such as in trismus, temporomandibular joint disorders, or post-radiation fibrosis reduces the space for inserting and maneuvering the laryngoscope. Reduced neck mobility, seen in cervical spine injury, arthritis or ankylosing spondylitis prevents optimal head extension and alignment of the oral, pharyngeal, and laryngeal axes making glottic visualization more difficult. And finally, the fifth D covers other difficult features that may not change airway anatomy but still complicate management. Massive obesity adds soft tissue bulk, impairs mask seal, and speeds desaturation. Pregnancy causes airway edema, reduced lung volumes, and higher oxygen demand, shortening safe apnea time. Facial hair can break mask seal, and tubes or devices like nasogastric tubes or cervical collars can obstruct access or positioning. We should also note that mask ventilation precedes laryngoscopy, which in turn is followed by intubation, so the assessment should follow a systematic sequence that mirrors these steps. The first step is to consider predictors of difficult mask ventilation, for which mnemonics like moans and bones are widely used. MOAN stands for mask seal problems, obesity, age greater than 55 years, no teeth, and snoring or sleep apnea. BONE stands for beard, obesity, no teeth, elderly, and snoring or sleep apnea. The presence of any one of these features should raise suspicion for potential difficulty in mask ventilation. When it comes to predicting difficult laryngoscopy and intubation, there are a lot of individual bedside tests and grouped scoring systems, but in clinical practice, one of the most practical and widely used is the LEMON assessment. LEMON is a simple mnemonic that helps us quickly remember and perform the essential steps of airway evaluation. We will look into them in detail. Look externally means performing a rapid visual survey of the patient's face and neck for any obvious findings that might complicate airway management. We have discussed them in the 5 Ds of airway examination. Evaluate 332 refers to the simple bedside measurements used to estimate the available space for laryngoscopy and intubation. This rule involves three sequential measurements performed with the head in a neutral position. The first step is measuring mouth opening. The patient is asked to open their mouth as wide as possible, and the assessor places their own fingers or uses the patient's fingers vertically between the upper and lower incisors to estimate the gap. A normal mouth opening should allow at least three finger breaths. This indicates that there is adequate space to insert and manipulate the laryngoscope blade during intubation. The second step is measuring the mandibular space, which is the distance from the tip of the chin to the hyoid bone. This is again estimated using finger breaths with three finger breaths considered normal. Adequate mandibular space allows the tongue to be displaced anteriorly during laryngoscopy without compressing airway structures. The third step is measuring the distance from the hyoid bone to the thyroid notch, which reflects the vertical position of the larynx. A normal measurement is at least two finger breaths. A shorter distance suggests a more anterior larynx, which can make glottic visualization more challenging. Along with the lemon criteria, the assessment can also include the thyromental distance and the upper lip bite test. The thyromental distance is the straight line measurement from the thyroid notch to the tip of the chin with the neck fully extended. It serves as an indicator of the mandibular space available to accommodate the tongue during laryngoscopy. A measurement of less than 6.5 cm or approximately 3 finger breadth suggests limited space. 
The upper lip bite test evaluates mandibular mobility and dental architecture by assessing the patient's ability to bite the upper lip with the lower incisors. Restricted movement or inability to reach the vermilion border of the upper lip correlates with reduced oral access and more challenging glottic visualization. M in lemon stands for malampati, referring to the modified malampati classification which assessed the visibility of certain structures during maximal mouth opening with the tongue protruded. The patient is seated upright, instructed to open the mouth fully and stick out the tongue without making any sound. The examiner notes the structures visible. In class 1, the soft palate, fauces, uvula, and pillars are visible. In class 2, the soft palate, fauces, and uvula are visible, but the pillars are not. In class 3, only the soft palate and base of the uvula are visible. In class 4, only the hard palate is seen. Progressively higher classes correlate with reduced oropharyngeal space and a greater likelihood of a difficult laryngoscope view. The O in lemon stands for obstruction, which refers to anything that narrows, blocks or distorts the airway. This includes structural issues like tumors, swelling, enlarged tonsils or congenital abnormalities. It also covers traumatic causes such as facial fractures, hematomas, bleeding, or foreign bodies in the airway. Lastly, inflammatory or infectious conditions like epiglottitis, abscesses, or severe allergic reactions can cause airway swelling. Warning signs like strider, muffled speech or difficulty swallowing should raise concern for obstruction. Finally, neck mobility describes how well a patient can move their neck, especially bending the head forward and extending it backward. These movements are important because they help line up the oral, pharyngeal and laryngeal axes which is essential for successful direct laryngoscopy. The sniffing position, achieved by flexing the neck forward and extending the head at the atlanto-occipital joint helps align these axes for easier intubation. At the bedside, you can check neck mobility by asking the patient to bend the head forward so the chin touches the chest to assess flexion, and then to look up as far as possible to assess extension. Measuring the sternomental distance, which is the distance from the tip of the chin to the top of the sternum with the neck fully extended is another useful test. A measurement of less than 12.5 cm suggests limited mobility. Limited neck extension can result from cervical spine disease, previous spinal fusion, halo fixation, or trauma. We also use combined scoring systems that incorporate multiple individual parameters to predict airway difficulty. One such system is the Wilson score given here. The last part of airway assessment is investigation, which is used when clinical examination suggests potential difficulty or anatomical abnormalities. Neck x-rays can show limited movement or unusual anatomy while CT and MRI provide detailed views in cases of tumors, trauma, or congenital anomalies. Ultrasound helps assess tongue size, preepiglottic space, and locate the cricothyroid membrane, and flexible endoscopy allows direct visualization of obstructions or lesions. These investigations complement the bedside assessment and help plan airway management in difficult cases. Once the airway assessment is done, we proceed with laryngoscopy where we encounter different views of glottic structures. These views are described by Cormac Lehane laryngoscopic view. Grade 1 means the full glottis is visible, indicating easy intubation. Grade 2 shows only a partial view of the glottis, which may require some manipulation like pressure on the anterior neck by assistant. Grade 3 reveals only the epiglottis making intubation more challenging and often needing adjuncts like a bougie or video laryngoscope. Grade 4 shows neither the glottis nor the epiglottis, representing a potentially very difficult or impossible intubation without advanced airway techniques. This grading system helps anesthesiologists anticipate difficulties, plan alternative strategies, and document airway findings for future reference. To end the video, 
Airway assessment also involves anticipating potential difficulties with backup techniques, like using supraglottic airway devices, in case standard intubation fails. The ROD's mnemonic helps guide this evaluation. R stands for restricted mouth opening which can make device insertion challenging. O is for obstructions such as tumors, swelling, or foreign bodies that may block the airway. D refers to distorted airway anatomy including congenital anomalies, trauma, or previous surgery that alters normal structures. S stands for stiff lungs or cervical spine which may limit neck movement or lung compliance complicating ventilation. Time.